thank you for allowing us to be here today. As we reflect on this key event in human history, I pray that you'll give us sober minds to discuss it wisely, to discuss it well. Help us set aside any biases that we might have. Obviously, we do want the resurrection of Jesus to have happened, Lord. But let us not be so blinded by our desire for that to have happened that we don't look at the facts objectively. Help us simply interpret as historians and follow the truth where it leads because we trust that you are the truth and ultimately it will lead us back to you. We love you. We praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Today we are bringing our study of the resurrection of Jesus to a conclusion. The way we've been going about the studies, we've been looking at five historical bedrock facts that practically every historian will agree did happen. And from those five facts, we are going to basically determine what we think as historians actually happened um, 2,000 years ago uh, in this, just outside the city of Jerusalem in a garden tomb, right? Did Jesus resurrect or did something else happen, right? Once again, these five facts are not really up for debate. Um, any historian who has genuinely studied the, this, the time period that we're dealing with, they will agree on these five facts. However, obviously some people will disagree on the conclusion that you come to about these five facts. Uh, And so that's really what we're going to be wrestling through today. We're going to look at the fifth fact and then um, tonight, and then for those who are watching online in a separate video, uh, we are going to be doing concluding thoughts, uh, which are just going to be our final thoughts about the resurrection. Sound good? All right. Real quick, uh, rapid fire, not as much time. We've got a lot to cover today, so we're going to go a little bit quicker. Uh, Let's do a quick review. What was fact number one? A death by crucifixion. Does that prove that Jesus resurrected? No. No. What does it prove? It proves that he died. It proves that he died, Mm -hmm. right? Which is a necessary prerequisite to resurrection, right? You cannot resurrect unless you died first, right? Fact number two, what was it? Ladies. Ladies discovered the empty tomb. Does that prove that Jesus resurrected? Mm -hmm. No. What does it prove? There was an empty tomb. It proves that the tomb was empty. And we have good reason to believe that we know who discovered it, right? It was women in particular, right? And there's actually evidence just uh, in regards to the gender of who discovered it, right? Okay, thirdly, what was the third fact? Independent appearances after death. Yes, independent appearances after death. Does that prove that Jesus resurrected? Mm. No, but what does it prove? That there are witnesses. It proves that there are people who claimed to have seen him after death. Right? It doesn't even prove that they're correct. It simply proves that early on, there were people who claimed that they saw him after death. Right? Fourthly, what is that fact? The violence endured by the apostles. Violence endured by the apostles. Does that prove that Jesus resurrected? No. No, but what does it prove? There's people that at least claim to believe it enough that they were willing to suffer. Yeah, it proves that these people who said that they saw him alive after death were like they believed it with enough certainty and confidence that they were willing to suffer and even die for their faith. And it's even more important the fact that these are the apostles, right? This isn't just a random person who didn't know Jesus. These are the people who knew Jesus best and they were willing to go on and die for their faith. That's pretty good evidence, right? It doesn't prove he resurrected, but it proves that they definitely saw something that they believed to be a genuine resurrection. You could argue that they were wrong, but at the very least, they didn't think they were wrong. That leads us to fact number five, enemies of Christ converted. Today we are going to be looking at two particular people who we know were opposed to Jesus at one point, yet because of the resurrection of Jesus, they came to not only be believers in Jesus, but actually leaders in the early church. Uh, And the reason we're going to talk about that is not because this proves the resurrection, but it does prove that these people had some sort of experience that turned them from adversaries to Jesus into devoted followers of Jesus. And this experience took place after his death. Mm. That is really crucial. All right? And then from there, we will move on and we'll talk about our concluding thoughts and try to figure out, as historians, what we think best happened. Sound good? Mm-hmm. All right, so, fact number five, enemies of Christ converted. Uh, anybody want to take a guess about the two people we're going to be talking about today? One of them is Paul. One of them is Paul. Who's the other one? James? James, the brother of Jesus. Yes, very good. All right, let's talk about Paul first. Paul, the persecutor. There he is, his glorious face just sitting right there. We don't know what Paul actually looked like, but let's talk about Paul. All right, so there's abundant evidence testifying to the fact that prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul was an early opponent to Christianity. 
Given the criterion of embarrassment, it is extremely unlikely that the early church would fabricate this detail. Uh, somebody remind me what the criterion of embarrassment is and what I mean by that statement. Whenever there's a detail that's stated that is not appealing, or it's not like... Flattering? Yes, there we go. I was about to say complimenting. Flattering to the person who is saying it, and so therefore it makes it more valid because people don't naturally want to be vulnerable and say bad things about themselves. Yeah. Well, and especially, like it's one thing, if, if I'm writing an account about somebody who I don't like, I'm more likely to put something bad about them. But we know yeah. that the New Testament authors... Well, they like the apostles, right? They want you to trust in the apostles. And so they have every motive to say flattering things about them. Yet, what we see here about Paul is that he is not portrayed in a very flattering light, right? And especially in the book of Acts, right? The book of Acts is where we get a lot of this information from. And that was written by Luke, one of Paul's traveling companions. And we know that Luke liked Paul. We know that Paul liked Luke. And so if Luke is going to record these details, it would seem to suggest that he's actually just reporting what is true. Because sharing this information about Paul is not going to win you any favors, right? It's not like, I mean, if you tell somebody, hey, um, I'm, a, I'm a former terrorist. Do you want to be friends with me? Most people are going to say, no, hard pass, right? Because they're, <laughs> they're going to want to stay away from you, right? Much less, like, they're not going to listen to you whenever you start talking about love and joy and peace. Yes. And so um, the criteria of embarrassment would suggest that these accounts are true. Yeah. Uh, and even if we didn't have the criteria of embarrassment... We have several accounts from several people which come very early on which testify the fact that he was a persecutor, mm -hmm. right? Acts chapter 7, right? Uh, and when they had driven Stephen out of the city, they began stoning him. And witnesses laid aside their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now Saul was in hearty agreement with them putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He was delivering them into prison. Not only was Saul a persecutor of the church, but he was the one who kicked off the first wave of Christian persecution to have ever existed. Right? Uh, prior to this, the persecution facing Christians was very small. Right? It was the religious leaders um, who put them on trial, basically. And they would have them flogged. But right here... This is where the first wave of governmental, judicial, like widespread persecution against the church begins. And it all begins with a young man named Saul, right? Who we also know as Paul, right? They're the same person. Uh, and so Saul is the reason why the church is scattered. Uh, and we've talked about this in the past. But in the book of Acts, uh, this is actually why the Great Commission ends up getting fulfilled, right? You'll notice that persecution begins in Jerusalem. And as a result, the church has to scatter to Judea and Samaria. Right? And then persecution is going to expand to Judea and Samaria, and therefore it's going to have to go to the ends of the earth. And if you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? And so persecution actually leads to the fulfilling of the Great Commission in the book of Acts. Uh, and so that's from the book of Acts, but in Galatians itself, which was written earlier than the book of Acts, Paul himself testifies to the same thing. He says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. How I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being far more zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So in the book of Galatians there, keep in mind, Galatians is one of the earliest books of the New Testament we have written. Right? It's one of the earliest ones, if you're just looking chronologically speaking. Paul says that they have heard of his former conduct. What does that imply? That he was a persecutor. That he... Well, when he says, you have heard of my former conduct. What does that imply about the church in Galatia? It, impl it implies this is not new information to them. Right? So not only, not only is the book of Galatians one of the earliest New Testament documents we have, but even in that document, Paul is saying, you're already aware of this information, which means that the, the broader church's awareness of Paul's former status as a persecutor of the church was widespread very early on. Right? I mean, Galatians is being written in the early A.D. 50s. Jesus was crucified in the early A.D. 30s. So Galatians is written less than 20 years later, and Galatia is in Asia Minor. Right? It, it's not anywhere near where... Oh, wait, is Galatia Asia Minor? Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's not anywhere near Jerusalem. Right? And so here we have this awareness within, within the first few decades of the church 
even people living thousands of miles away from Jerusalem, they were already aware of the fact that Paul was a persecutor of the church. And despite this, they had welcomed him as an apostle. Right? That's just important to recognize as his story. Right? <clears throat> we move on. Philippians chapter 3. This is written a little bit later. For we are the circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Philippians is written about ten years after Galatians. And so that means that even though ten years have passed, Paul's story is still the same. right? Philippians is being written around the same time as the book of Luke. And so you've got uh, the book of Luke and Acts. Um, but so we, we have this consistent testimony spanning the test of time that Paul began not as a follower of the way, but a persecutor of the church. What's another thing that you notice in common with what I just read in Philippians and in Galatians in the last verse? He didn't just mention how he was against the church, but what did he mention about his own per personal life in regards to Judaism? He was zealous for what he thought was right. Like he was zealous and he was excelling in the ranks. Right? Whenever you hear Paul describe his former life, he says that things were going really, really well for him. That's important to keep in mind as well, because um, eventually, whenever we're going to talk about his conversion, um, you know, we're going to say that it probably had to center around the resurrection, but some people could argue, well, maybe he had another motive for converting, right? Maybe, you know, sometimes people have motives for lying, right? Maybe he didn't think that he saw the resurrected Jesus. Maybe he just thought life as a Christian would be better. But whenever you look at Paul's testimony, he is quick to admit that his life was far more comfortable prior to following Christ, right? He says, I was advancing to the ranks. I was well-respected. I was a persecutor of the church. And then once he becomes a Christian, all of a sudden, he's being persecuted all the time, right? So just keep that in mind. First Timothy, this is closer to the end of Paul's life. He says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he regarded me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, right? So once again, spanning the test of time, every letter is, well, not every letter, but every time Paul brings up his former life, he mentions he was an aggressor against the church. This is once again in Galatians. And I was still unknown by, by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now proclaiming the good news of the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. So Paul is once again reflecting on his early days as a Christian. And he says that the churches in Judea, they didn't even know who he was, right? They had never met him. All they had heard about him was his reputation. And his reputation was the fact that he was formerly a persecutor and he has come to Christ, right? So all of them were surprised by this too. Uh, and this is one reason why some of them kind of rejected him at first because, you know, it, it's a pretty crazy story, right? You're not naturally... Like, if somebody who formally persecuted you all of a sudden says that they want to be friends with you, mm -hmm. you're going to inherently think they have ulterior motives, mm -hmm. right? You're going to doubt them. You're going to think that maybe they're trying to be a double agent. Maybe they're trying to be a spy. You're not just going to blindly accept it. And Paul admits that that's exactly how they responded, right? And so not only does he say that he was a persecutor, and not only does Luke say that he was a persecutor, but whenever you actually look at how they discuss the early church reacting to him, it's consistent with what you would expect if he was, in fact, a persecutor of the church. Make sense? And therefore, this is what Michael Icona says. <clears throat> Thus, Paul's notorious pre-Christian activities and conversion are multiply attested. Firstly, by Paul's own testimony that he himself writes within roughly 20 to 30 years of the events. Secondly, by Luke's record in Acts, written 30 to 60 years after the events. And thirdly, by a story that was probably circulating among Christians in Judea and that most likely dates to within three to a little more than 10 years of Paul's conversion. Right? So very early on, we have reliable reason to believe that there was this guy named Saul or Paul who violently persecuted the church. Does that mean that he killed Christians? No. But we do know that he marked them off to be put to death. And we know that at least in one instance, he stood there basically as the ringleader cheering people on as they did stone somebody to death. Right? Was he himself getting his hands dirty? Maybe not. But if anything, that might make him, make him worse. Um, because he was so concerned with his own self-righteousness that maybe he didn't dirty his hands with their blood, right? But uh, we do know that he was violently persecuting the church, 
Everybody testifies to this, and he himself owns up to it. That's important. Likewise, there is abundant evidence that Paul's conversion to Christianity was a direct result of a Damascus Road experience which he believed to be an encounter with the resurrected Christ. His conversion experience is referenced on several occasions in Scripture. Paul himself mentions it in the book of Galatians. He mentions it twice in 1 Corinthians. He mentions it another two times in 2 Corinthians. And in the book of Acts, Paul himself recounts the story three times. Right? He mentions it in Acts chapter 9, and then he mentions it when he's on trial twice, in Acts chapter 22 and in Acts chapter 26. Uh, and what's really interesting is that whenever you look at all those stories um, in the book of Acts, every single time Paul actually mentions slightly different details about the account um, to where whenever you look at all three of them together, you get a better understanding of what exactly happened on that Damascus Road moment, right? <laughs> Mike Wycona says this, Paul's commitment to the message he preached leads us to conclude that he sincerely believed in the truth of his message, right? And so whenever you actually look at Paul's lifestyle afterwards, whenever you look at the testimony that he gave, we have good reason to believe that he genuinely believed this stuff. And it all comes down, back down to that Damascus Road experience where Paul, by his own testimony several times, says that the resurrected Jesus appeared to him, right? It wasn't simply a random voice. If you remember, whenever he's riding to Damascus, he is knocked down and a voice from heaven says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, right? So this is the post-resurrection Jesus appearing to Paul. And according to Paul, on several occasions, that is the moment that changed his life forever. Therefore, we can say this. The majority of modern scholars grant that Paul had an experience that he was convinced was an appearance to him of the risen Jesus. Habermas, in light of his survey of more than 30 years of critical scholarship in relationship to Jesus' resurrection, writes, Perhaps no fact is more widely recognized than that early Christian believers had real experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. In particular, virtually all scholars recognize Paul's testimony that he had an experience that he believed was an appearance of the risen Jesus. <clears throat> Seldom is the historical authenticity of any of these testimonies or the genuine belief behind them challenged by respected critical scholars, no matter how skeptical. We must agree that Paul's belief that the risen Jesus had appeared to him is not proof that Jesus in fact did. For our purposes, we may conclude that Paul converted from a staunch persecutor of the church to one of its most aggressive advocates. Accordingly, we may add the appearance of Paul to uh, the appearance of Paul to our collection of facts that make up our historical bedrock. One thing that he says there at the end is very, very important. All because Paul converted, does that prove that Jesus resurrected? No. It doesn't prove that at all. And he says we don't really need it to, right? That's not what we're arguing, right? We're not saying, ha ha, Paul, per Paul converted to Christianity, therefore the resurrection happened. What we're simply showing from a historical perspective is that there was some sort of transformation that occurred. And at the very least, that tells us that Paul himself believed that Jesus resurrected, right? It doesn't mean that he did. It just means that he believed that he did whenever he had every motive to believe otherwise. And so, as we're trying to examine the evidence, now we have to figure out, did Paul have any other motives that could have possibly gotten him to convert to Christianity? And ultimately, can we speak for everybody's motives? No. no, right? And so, is there a hypothetical reality where Paul might have had some ulterior motive for converting to Christianity, uh, even if he didn't see a resurrected Jesus? Sure, maybe. But ultimately, as historians, since we can't read people's minds, all we can do is look at the evidence and try to figure out what best conclusion to come to, right? And so at the very least, we know that Paul believed he saw the resurrected Jesus uh, because all the evidence would seem to point in that way. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, so that is a matter of historical bedrock. <laughs> and then we can continue. As we have already seen in our study of the violence endured by the apostles, Paul demonstrated a clear willingness to suffer and die for his faith. According to tradition, he was martyred for his faith during the reign of Nero. Right? Um, prior to his conversion, he lived comfortably, ascending through the ranks of Judaism. <clears throat> this is what Paul says in Acts chapter 22 when he's about to recount his testimony again. He says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but having been brought up in this city, 
having been instructed at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictness of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. We learn a lot of things about Paul here. He comes from a Jewish family, right, that grew up in Gentile territory. If you read the rest of the book of Acts, you will know that Paul also has Roman citizenship. He did not buy it for himself, which would seem to imply that he either got it another way. Most likely, his parents had bought the Roman citizenship, which would seem to imply that his parents might have been a little bit wealthier, right? Or maybe his grandparents or something, right? He, he might have come from a wealthier family, right? Which would explain why, as a child, he was sent away from Cilicia to Jerusalem so that he could be raised up at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, Gamaliel is a well-known rabbi that we even know about outside the Bible. He was well-respected. Uh, and it's been reported that of every, like, thousand people that applied to be his disciple, he would only select one. Right? So Gamaliel was very well-respected in the community at this time period. And those odds, you know, those statistics might be exaggerated a little bit. But the idea is that Gamaliel was very highly respected. Yet Paul, a Jew growing up far away from Jerusalem, he was sent as a child to be raised at this guy's feet, right? So we get the idea that Paul is somebody who comes from possible wealth. In many ways, he is viewed as a Jewish prodigy. Uh, and then that's consistent with what we read about him later on, right? Philippians chapter four. <clears throat> or, uh, actually, I think it's Philippians chapter three. I forgot to put the chapter in there. He says this. <clears throat> if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the time of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is under the law, found blameless. So whenever you look at Paul's former life, he had everything he wanted, right? He had dual citizenship. He was Jew and Gentile. He came from probably a wealthy family. He was viewed as a child prodigy who was raised up under one of the leading rabbis of his time, right? His family was so devout that they raised him according to the law. Right? He was circumcised on the eighth day. He knew exactly what tribe he came from. He came from the same tribe as his namesake. Right, His name is Saul. Well, King Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. So does he. Right, <clears throat> He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Right, Whenever people would have looked at him, he was as Jewish as it gets. He was the picture-perfect, ideal Jewish man. Right, He was a Pharisee. He belonged to the strictest sect of Judaism, the one that people looked to for their guidance and righteousness. As to zeal, he was a person through the church. He was so zealous for God, right? Like, it, it's not that his, like, his obedience wasn't simply emotionless, right? He wasn't simply going through the motions. He was so fired up about God that whenever he saw this her heretical sect called Christianity growing up, he decided that he was going to kill them, right? Because he thought that that was his duty to God, right? And that's not even what the Pharisees typically did, right? The Pharisees typically didn't raise up arms against people, but that's what Saul decided he was going to do because that's how zealous he was. Whenever you looked at his actual lifestyle, there was no great sin that you could call him out on, right? As to righteousness under the law, he was blameless, right? If he committed a sin, he offered the appropriate sacrifices, he washed himself clean, he did everything necessary, he checked all the boxes. So whenever you look at Paul's former life, prior to becoming a Christian, he is literally the picture-perfect example of somebody, like, if there was anybody in the world who had everything, it's Paul. However, Paul's life got harder after he came to Christ. He gave up his comfort, his prestige, his pride, and his entire former way of life to endure great suffering and ultimately give up his life for the very sect that he started off persecuting. As historians, <clears throat> we might not be able to answer this question, but the question we're forced to ask is what could cause him to do this? It'd be one thing if he had clear motives, right? Some people... <laughs> they will promote a lie because they have things that they want to gain, right? If they think that they can gain enough wealth, they'll do it. Um, usually there's three things that will motivate people to do something, right? Wine, women, or wealth, mm -hmm. right? Um, so they say wine, and that's really just the idea of pleasure in general, right? If there is something pleasurable, uh, and, and if in their judgment, they think it's pleasurable enough, they will lie in order to achieve it. Mm -hmm. But was Christianity, <laughs> were the early Christians receiving much pleasure out of being Christians? Well, no, if you go back to fact number four, they weren't, right? They were called to deny themselves, pick up the cross, follow after Jesus. And that literally meant to pick up your cross and follow, right? You could die for your faith. So there wasn't much pleasure to be gained, right? So there's wine, that's out. Women, all right, well, 
<clears throat> um, if you look at like the modern day cults that get started, one thing that they almost all have in common is that the cult leader starts saying that he gets to sleep with every woman in the group, right? If you look at Joseph Smith, uh, if you look at uh, David Koresh, right? All these different people who start cults, what they begin to do is they start saying, hey, your wife is my wife now because they want to sleep with more women. Well, what do the early Christians teach? A leader must be a husband of one wife, right? So, no. Other, like kings and stuff, they might have multiple wives, but not our leaders, right? Our leaders have one wife, okay? So if you have that lust, well, guess what? You've got to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow. Amen. Well, there goes the women thing. All right, what about wealth, right? Sometimes people will promote a lie because they'll get money out of it. Well, the early church had all things in common. And whenever you actually look at Paul and his writings, <clears throat> he's very careful with his money. He'll write to the church and he'll say, hey, whenever I was amongst you, I could have charged money, but I didn't want you to think I had ulterior motives. So instead, I didn't charge money. And I did work on the side. We know that Paul was a tent maker by trade uh, because whenever he would go places, rather than let, letting them pay him, he would literally be preaching and then doing tent making, right? Dude probably didn't get much sleep. <laughs> He's probably busy. Um, and so whenever you look at it, it doesn't seem like he has any motives to promote this lie because... He had everything he wanted prior to becoming a Christian. And after becoming a Christian, all he faces is hardship and suffering and pain. And then he ends up dying for it. Yes, sir? I think that's why people don't want to come to Christ because they, they enjoy the pleasure of their life. And Well, that could, be, you know, that could be one reason, but I mean... Maybe. I mean, nowadays we don't... It doesn't cost us as much nowadays. It probably should cost us more. Yeah. Because um, even as Christians, I mean, a lot of people come to Christ because they, all, they want all the good stuff that... This promise, yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but for Paul, it's hard to discern any motive he would have for converting to Christianity. Again, we can't perceive people's every single motives, and so he could have some motive that we just can't tell. But I mean, if we're just looking at the evidence, it's hard to figure out what he could possibly like. It, it just kind of forces our hands to think he must have genuinely believed that he saw the resurrected Jesus, right? And if he was the type of person that he says he was and he was super zealous for God, well, then it only follows that the moment he realized he was wrong, he would have just about faced and, and gone the other direction, right? This wasn't a guy, like, he doesn't portray himself as a person who was a fake. No, he says, I was genuinely passionate about God. I was just genuinely wrong, right? And so the moment that God shows him that he's wrong, he repents, right? It's like King David, right? It's like, in that moment, he's like, oh my gosh. He, like, he had everything, and all it did was seal his sin even more. And so the moment he realizes he's incorrect, he repents and he begins to serve God correctly, right? And so all this testimony would seem to be consistent with what you would expect. <laughs> and therefore, uh, this is what uh, Gary Habermas and Mike Lycona say. People usually convert to a particular religion because they have heard the message of that religion from a secondary source and believe the message. That's true for us, right? For us, we didn't see the resurrected Jesus, right? We simply have believed in what the apostles handed down in Scripture. However, Paul's case is different. Paul's conversion was based on what he perceived to be a personal appearance of the risen Jesus, right? That is very important, right? Whenever I come to faith in Christ, I am simply trusting in the words of Scripture, trusting in the words of my parents, trusting in the words of my pre like my pastor. That's not what Paul's doing. He is converting, not because of the words of the fellow apostles, it's because he believes the genuine resurrected Jesus appeared to him. So he becomes an eyewitness. Today we might believe that Jesus rose from the dead based on secondary evidence, trusting Paul and the disciples who saw the risen Jesus. But for Paul, his experience came from primary evidence. The risen Jesus appeared directly to him. He did not merely believe based on the testimony of someone else. That's just super important for us to recognize. Mm -hmm. right? That's why this is super duper crucial. Right? It'd be one thing if... Peter came in, sat down with Paul, they had a debate, and Paul came to Christ. Well, because then, that doesn't mean that Jesus resurrected. It simply means that Peter's really convincing. But that's not how Paul came to Christ. By his own testimony, on several occasions, the thing that changed everything for him was the resurrection of Jesus. And like we already saw before, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, the resurrection is the thing that makes or breaks things. So Paul recognized in his own life how central the resurrection was. Because that was the thing that made him a Christian. <clears throat> Sean McDowell says this, How, amid such severe persecution and the possibility of death, could Paul so boldly proclaim the gospel? The answer lies in his belief that the risen Jesus, whom he claimed to have personally seen, had already defeated death. 
Unlike later martyrs who suffered and died for resurrection reports that came secondhand from the testimony of others, Paul had seen the risen Jesus firsthand. Right? Think about that. Right? Whenever we read the Apostle Paul's letters, right, a lot of times we're astounded by the depth of his faith. Right? Because we just see, I mean, this dude is like in chains and he's just like singing songs. And he's like, like literally in the book of Philippians, he's the one in jail and he's writing letters to free people and he's saying, rejoice when you face trials. And it's like, he, He's writing a letter of comfort to other people from his jail cell. That's crazy. And whenever we look at Paul, we can't help but be astounded by that. And we're like, wow, Paul's amazing. But if you consider it, well, Paul saw the resurrected Jesus. He knew for a fact that you had nothing to fear in death. For us, we simply believe that by faith. right? Like, whenever, like if somebody were to come in here and start persecuting us, that becomes very difficult for us. Because now we have to ask ourselves, do I trust? Like that the words of the apostles are true, right? Do I trust that scripture is true? But that's not what Paul had to do. Whenever people began to, you know, flog him and stuff, all he had to do was look back in his mind to that Damascus road. Mm -hmm. And he had to say, I saw him, right? For him, it wasn't simply trusting in secondhand evidence. Mm -hmm. That's why we're doing this whole study, right? We're having to do this study because we want to make sure we have good reason to believe it. Because I believe that if somebody comes in here and does try to take our life, we should die for our faith. But the thing is, we shouldn't just blindly do that, right? We want to examine the evidence and make sure we have good reason. But Paul didn't have to, right? Paul had eyewitness evidence, right? He had seen it himself. That makes all the difference in the world. And so there's Paul. Now, let's talk about <laughs> good old brother James. Uh, fun fact, whenever I was leading my students through this um, last year in my apologetics class, so many girls had a crush on James right here. Uh, they saw that, and they are like, whoa. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's an AI-generated image, but um, they were like, wow, we want, to, uh, we want to meet James. All right, James the Skeptic. Let's talk about him. I'm going to need one of y'all to read real quick because my voice is getting kind of scratchy. I've been sick for like the last week. Uh, all right, the Gospels make it clear that Jesus' family was united in their opposition to his ministry during those three years of his ministry, right? Uh, could somebody read Mark chapter 3, uh, those verses for me? Go for it, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat a meal. And when his own heard this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, He has lost his senses. Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him, calling him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about... And looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. All right. Thank you. So whenever we look at the Gospels, all right, we see something that makes a lot of people really uncomfortable. Um, but a lot of times people just don't even look at it that much because it probably makes them so uncomfortable. It's very easy to just overlook. <laughs> but Jesus' family, they did not believe in him uh, prior to his death. Right? I mean, right here, it says that when his own heard this, talking about his family, they went to take custody of him, for they were saying he has lost his senses. They think Jesus is crazy. Right? I mean, it's one thing. Obviously, growing up, they knew he was different. Right? I mean, Mary, I mean, he, she was a virgin whenever she conceived him. Right? So she knew he was different. But now he's claiming things that nobody expected. Right? And we know from the Gospels that they had a tough time understanding this because... The idea of somebody being God in the flesh, it's not easy to conceive, especially for somebody like this, right? I mean, it'd be easier for the apostles to believe in Jesus than for his family. Because the apostles, they mainly got to know Jesus when he was 30 years old, right? And even then, it's still hard to wrap your mind around. But imagine you're his mother. Imagine you gave birth to him, right? Imagine that you had to wipe his runny nose. Imagine that you had to bandage his scraped knee. Imagine you, you know, you had to get onto him as a child. Right? And maybe he was never wrong, <laughs> but as a parent, sometimes you're wrong. And so you might have gotten onto him anyways. Right? We have one instance of that in Luke chapter 2. Whenever, remember, they, they accidentally lost him in Jerusalem? And they get onto him and they say, Why were you here? And he says, Guys, I was just in my father's house. Chill. Right? So they got onto him, but they were in the wrong. But it'd be hard, right? For, like, as parents who raise this child, even if you know he's destined for greatness, if he's claiming the things that Jesus is claiming, you're not going to actually believe in him. 
right? You're going to think that this is crazy, and that's what they see. And we even see that his mother is there, right? His mother and his brothers arrived. And then it's not like not only do they reject him, but Jesus also rejects them, right? So people come up to him and they say, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And rather than saying, oh, usher them in, he responds and says, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So a lot of times people will emphasize that last part and they'll say, see, we are all a family in Jesus. But you can't, like, like, people often overlook the implication of what Jesus is doing here. By saying that his family are the people who do the will of God, he's implying that the people who are knocking outside the door are not his family, yeah. right? Because he says, who, who are they? They're not my mother and brother. No, y'all are my mother and brother and sister, right? And the implication is that his mother and brothers are currently not doing the will of God, right? And so Jesus is actually judging his family right here, which is kind of a big deal. And this is consistent without the rest of the Gospels, right? Mark chapter 6. Uh, Brian, could you read that for me? Mm -hmm. uh, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these, th get these things? What is, uh, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are the are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could <coughs> do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. All right. So here's an instance where Jesus goes to Nazareth and he is rejected not only by his family, but by his entire hometown. But what's interesting right here is that while they're in the synagogue, the people even mention that his family is with them present in the synagogue right there. Right. And are not his sisters here with us. Right. They're like, hey, we know who this guy is. Right. This is Mary's son. The brothers are here. The sisters are here. We get them all named out. And you can see that James is in the list of that. So it's not like James is the exception. Yeah. No, James is with them, right? James is one of the brothers who is listed here as being in the synagogue. Yet, do any of them come to Jesus' defense? Yeah. Nope. No, they don't. In Jesus' response, it says, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Right? He says, Anywhere else people will believe in me, but y'all won't. But there's also a general truth to this, right? In general, the reason why a prophet is not without honor in his, or the, the reason why the prophet is without honor in his hometown is because people know you better there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, in general, um, like this is, this is what you'll see, like, like, like anybody who becomes like a pastor who had like, you know, a rough life going for like as a young child or something like that, they have a tough time making a name for themselves in their hometown because everybody remembers who they were, right? They're like, no, we remember you. You're the one who was always like stealing hubcaps off cars and getting thrown mm -hmm. in jail. Now you're a preacher man and you're going to tell us how to be righteous, right? People in their hometown are not going to believe in you, right? However, if you go move to a new place and they don't know your past, well, they're more likely to believe in you because they only know you as you are, right? And so there's a general truth to this, and that's what Jesus is highlighting. He says, everybody else believes in me. I come to Nazareth and nobody believes in me because you all remember me, right? And you don't, like, to, like he's, he's acknowledging the fact that his claims are confusing them because here he is claiming to be God in the flesh, and they're like, we know you, right? What do you mean you're the son of God? No, you're the son of Mary. Mary's right there. We remember how everybody speculated about her whenever she got pregnant with you. Mm -hmm. And now you have the audacity to bring us up again, right? You're just going to make us question your birth again? Just chill, Jesus, right? Like, and so he, he gets rejected here. Uh, and we do know from other gospel accounts that he ends up getting kicked out of the synagogue here, right? And they end up taking him to a cliff and they're getting ready to throw him off. Do his... Does his family come to his defense? No. Wow. John chapter 7. <clears throat> After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booth was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Wow. That last phrase right there is really important. Because John, it seems like he's trying to mislead you a little bit. 
right? Because what is what the brothers of Jesus seem to be saying is good advice. They're saying, hey, Jesus, if you really are this big deal, you should probably go to Jerusalem, right? That's where, you know, if, if you, like, that's where you can really have your big shot, right? If you go to Jerusalem, proclaim yourself there, people will love you. That's what it sounds like they're saying. But then John says, for not even his brothers believed in him. And so you have to realize that the entire thing is sp- spoken with sarcasm in their head, in their minds. Oh, Jesus, if you really are such a big deal, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and just let everybody know? Because that's where all the hot shots go, right? <laughs> and so th- that's what John is trying to convey there, right? They're mocking him, right? And he says, in, in John's assessment, is not even his brothers, right? So not only are the people rejecting Jesus, his own family is, right? If you remember the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Mm-hmm. Well, according to John, not even his brothers did. And so whenever you look at the Gospels, the unanimous testimony is that during his ministry, Jesus was rejected by his family. By the time of Jesus' death, Jesus' siblings were evidently still not following him. We know this because there's only one member of his family present at the cross, and that's his mom. Because even if his mom wasn't fully understanding things, or maybe she did come to believe by this point, we don't know, but that's her son, right? Even if she thinks her son is crazy, She's going to be there at the cross. Mm -hmm. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Mm -hmm. If the brothers of Jesus were there, then Jesus would have entrusted Mary to them. Or even if they weren't present at the cross... If he thought they were worthwhile people to be trusted to, he would have said, Mother, be entrusted to James. Because James was seemingly the second oldest son. And Jesus had other brothers, and so and John's acknowledged the other brothers in his gospel. So John's aware that they exist. Yet in this moment, from the cross, Jesus says, I want you to treat John as your next of kin. Because John is the one disciple who was there. Right? So he says, John, you're the only person who is equipped to take care of my mother going forward. Mm-hmm. Mother, that is your son. So he's almost doing for Mary here what he had done to his family earlier. Whenever the family said, hey, we're here. And he said, who's my mother? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? Mm-hmm. To Mary, he's almost saying, who is your son? Not James. John right here, he's going to be your son going forward. Right. So even from the cross, Jesus is rejecting his family because they seemingly have rejected him. However... Something changed after the resurrection. In the book of Acts, we see his family participating in the church, though there is a distinction between them and those in authority. This is really cool. Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Acts chapter 1, the first eight verses, well, actually the first 11 verses, I think, they detail the ascension of Jesus. So Jesus dies, he resurrects, he's there for 40 days, and then he ascends. This is the next thing we read. And when they had entered the house, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. So those are all the apostles, right? Except for Judas Iscariot. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. (laughs) So... If you look at John chapter 19, the death of Jesus, his brothers reject him. Forty days later, less than a month later, or I mean less than a month and a half later, all of a sudden, they are of one accord, right? It says they were of one accord with the apostles. That means that Mary and Jesus' brothers, who were formerly opposed to Jesus during his ministry, after Jesus' death, are now on the same page with the apostles. That's interesting. Right? And it's not like 30 years have passed in between. It has been a month and a half. Less than a month and a half. Okay? Therefore, Michael Icona says, the preponderance of the evidence favors the conclusion that the brothers of Jesus were not counted among his followers through the time of Jesus' execution. By all accounts, they appear to have maintained a distance from their brother's ministry. Right? They didn't want to be associated with him. Right? We don't read that many stories about them, but when they do show up, they evidently did not want to be closely associated with him. However, when we see James again, he is a leader and possibly the final authority of the church in Jerusalem. 
this is super important. <laughs> All this is super important. But when I say he's the final authority, keep in mind, what city was the church born in? Where did Jesus die? Jerusalem. Where did he resurrect? Outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, right? Okay, so Jerusalem, Jerusalem. All right, where did he ascend from? Jerusalem. This is in, in the city of Bethany on the Mount of Olives, right? So just outside Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Where did the Holy Spirit descend? It's also Jerusalem, just so you know. <laughs> so the whole point I'm trying to say is that everything central about the church began in Jerusalem. And by the time we get to Acts chapter 15, it seems like James himself, the brother of Jesus, is the final authority of the church in Jerusalem. And whenever you actually look at our early church history outside of the Bible, it tells us that he was the bishop or the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. So apparently they left the brother of Jesus as the like lead pastor of the first ever Christian church. That's kind of a big deal, especially whenever you consider the fact that up until the death of Jesus, he was rejecting him. It's like something changed. <laughs> so this right here, Acts chapter 15, this takes place around AD 49, AD 50-ish. Um, this is what we call the Jerusalem Council, right? It's the first ever council um, that the church gathered for. Uh, basically, they come down to Jerusalem to discuss the matter of circumcision. Uh, and um, this is, so this is a little less than two decades after the death and resurrection, and supposed resurrection of Jesus. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had not a little dissension and debate with them, the brothers determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Right? So whenever Paul and Barnabas bring this up, right, uh, ultimately people say, you know what? We need to discuss this, right? Uh, basically what had been happening is that Paul and Barnabas had been going about their missionary journeys, and they had been telling people, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. But some people disagreed. And so they said, okay, rather than us debating about it, we need to get an official answer. You know, a lot of the apostles are down in Jerusalem. The, I mean, some of the apostles had scattered at this point. But they said, let's all go down to Jerusalem. Let's have a council. And let's just get a definitive answer from the authorities. Right? Because Jerusalem is the center of the church. And after the, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said, Brothers, you know that in the, early year, in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And then Peter goes on and he talks for a while. And typically when you read the gospels and stuff, who is the leading authority when it comes to the apostles? Wasn't that Peter? It's Peter, right? He's the yeah. spokesman. Right? He's the loudmouth. Whenever you look at the early chapters of the book of Acts, who is the first person to preach a Christian sermon? Peter. Peter. Right? So Peter is typically presented as the final voice of authority. But in Acts chapter 15, he's not the one who gives the final say. Right? He gets up and talks for a little bit. But then, after they had stopped speaking, James answered. And he says, Brothers, listen to me. Simon, Simeon, that's Peter, Right? He has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. Therefore, I judge that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from sexual immorality and from what is strangled and from blood. So James says, everybody listen to me. This is what Peter says. Here is my judgment. And if you keep reading the passage, they proceed to write a letter, and that letter is word for word, what James just told him to write. And so in many ways, it seems like James is the final say in Jerusalem, even over Peter, which is pretty crazy, right? But it seems like that's consistent with the early church testimony that he was the pastor of the Jerusalem church, right? Peter, he was obviously significant, but he's not, you know, he, he's an apostle, yes, but this is out of respect to James, right? James is in his home territory, so he's the one who gives the final verdict here. And we don't need to know exactly what role James was in. The main thing that I'm highlighting is that the brother of Jesus, who was once adversarial against him, is now being treated with so much respect that he is literally giving verdicts amongst the apostles. That's pretty crazy. All right. Uh, can somebody read Acts chapter 21 for me? Like that part right there. 
And after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God did among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. Perfect. So Paul once again goes out of Jerusalem. Uh, this is ultimately the visit to Jerusalem where Paul's going to get imprisoned, and he's ultimately going to make his way to Rome over the course of the final chapters of the book of Acts. But the main thing is whenever he gets to Jerusalem, the first thing they do uh, is they go to who? James. James, right? And it says, and the other elders were there. The implication is that James is the one in charge, right? They go to Jerusalem. They go to the church in Jerusalem. James is the one in charge. Oh, yeah, and the other dudes are there too, the other leaders. But James is the head honcho. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, ben, did you read that for me? Yeah. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have... Do we not have authority to eat and drink? Do we not have authority to take along a believing wife <clears throat> as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have authority to refrain from working, who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not consume the fruit of it, or who shepherds a flock and does not consume the milk of the flock? Perfect. So Paul, he's not even, like right now, he's not even really focusing on James or anything, right? He doesn't even mention James' name here. He's actually just talking about apostleship. Uh, and he's basically just saying, hey, do not apostles have the right to live life too, right? Paul is not himself married, but he says, if I wanted to be married, couldn't I? Right? He says, the rest of the apostles have wives, right? The brothers of the Lord, they have wives. Peter has a wife. But what I want you to notice is that all those people that Paul is citing are people who he views as authoritative in the church, right? You've got the apostles, and then who is Cephas? Cephas. Another name for Peter. That's Peter, right? So Cephas is just the Aramaic form of Peter. And so uh, Peter is an apostle, but, you know, he is viewed as the leader of the apostles, and so he's different. So there's the apostles, there's Cephas, and right in the middle, there's the brothers of the Lord. They're not called apostles, and that's because they don't meet the criteria for being apostles. Do you know what the criteria for being an apostle was? Yeah, so there's really three things, right? Uh, and the like the brothers of Jesus, as far as we know, really only meet one of those requirements, right? One of them, well, okay, basically you had to be there for his entire ministry, right? And, and that accounts for two of the things, right? You had to be there from the baptism of John, uh, like so basically when Jesus was baptized by John, all the way until the ascension, right? So whenever he's taken up, right? So you had to be there that entire time, basically from the beginning of his ministry to the end, and then the only other requirement is that you have to be a witness to the resurrection, right? You see that in Acts chapter 1, right? Uh, because basically they're trying to find a 12th apostle to replace Judas. And so those are their criteria for being an apostle. But the brothers of Jesus, they don't meet that because they were not there for his ministry, right? They rejected him. So even if they saw the resurrected Jesus, they're not apostles. However, you could understand why they would still be authoritative leaders in the church because even if they weren't there for the three years of Jesus' ministry, you know what they were there for? The 30 years prior, right? And so, like, yeah, they might not have been there for the actual, like, ministry stuff, but they still would have known him super well. And sure enough, whenever you read, like, the book of James, which is written by James, it almost sounds like Jesus himself wrote it, right? Which I guess in a way he did because it was written by the Holy Spirit of God speaking through James. But, like, whenever you read the book of James, it sounds so similar to the Sermon on the Mount. You can tell that this is a guy who grew up next to Jesus. Uh, and, and so that's why they're still viewed as authoritative despite the fact that they, you know, they weren't there for those three and a half years, um, but they still are viewed with authority, but they're not granted the title of apostle, right? But they are still lumped together with them. <clears throat> and I just want to highlight, it's not just James, right? The reason why we're focusing on James right now is because James is the one that we have the most evidence about, right? But you can really say that we're discussing about all the brothers of Jesus right here, but most of them aren't highlighted, really, right? Uh, Paul himself mentions this even earlier, uh, whenever you um, read the book of Galatians, right? And I'll remind you that the book of Galatians is written around A.D. 49 to 50, around the same time that the Jerusalem Council is happening, uh, which is also around the same time that the book of James is probably written too. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. Then three years later, so he's talking about three years after his conversion, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. So James right here is actually called an apostle by 
um, by Paul. Uh, but you would almost assume that um, he's using the, apostle, the word apostle there in a little bit different way. He's using it as just somebody with authority. Um, so there's a few things here. Uh, first off, it's really good that he clarifies that this is James, the Lord's brother, just to distinguish him from other Jameses that might have been you might get him confused with. Uh, even though um, the only other James you'd really possibly get him confused with is um, James, one of the apostles. Um, technically, there were two apostles named James. Um, one was James, son of Zebedee, and one was James, son of Alphaeus. Right? There's, so there's big James and little James. Um, but at this point, uh, by the time you get to AD 49 or 50, uh, James, son of Zebedee, was already dead. Right? Because he's killed in Acts chapter 12, which is around AD 42 to 44. So James, son of Zebedee, is already dead at that point. Uh, so there's only one other James who was an apostle. Uh, and so that's why Paul has to distinguish. Right? We're not talking about James, son of Alphaeus. We're talking about James, brother of Jesus. And he acknowledges that he is counted amongst the leaders of the church. Galatians chapter 2. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who worked in Peter unto his apostleship to the uh, circumcised worked in me also unto the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to shrink back and separate himself, fearing the party of the circumcision. So not, we, we see that James apparently was very strict, and Peter was afraid of it, <laughs> which is just kind of funny. Uh, and that actually lines up with early church testimony about James. Um, but the main thing here, Peter says that James, Peter, and John were refuted to be pillars of the church. This is something where you could easily get it confused again, because if you go back to the Gospels, Jesus had an inner three for his group, right? You have the 12 apostles, and then you have the inner three, which were Peter, James, and John. But those James and John were the sons of Zebedee. But like I said, by the time Paul's writing Galatians, James, son of Zebedee, is dead. And so it seems like, in light of James, son of Zebedee's death, James, brother of Jesus, took his place. That's a bit confusing, because you still have Peter, James, and John, but this is a different James. And so, according to Paul, uh, whenever he went down to Jerusalem, um, like, like, from his, like, this analysis of the situation, everybody viewed these three guys as the foundation of the church. Mm -hmm. Right? Peter... James and John, right? He says they were reputed to be pillars. He's not saying that there was like an official declaration of this. He's simply saying that like whenever you talk to people, that's kind of the general gist he got, right? These are the guys who were the ones in charge. Uh, and that makes sense. When you read the early chapters of the book of Acts, Peter and John are the ones going out and doing a lot of stuff together, mm -hmm. right? And then later on in Acts, James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. And so if you kind of compile all this together, you have good reason to think that he was actually um, the leader here. There are also uh, early accounts reporting that James died a martyr's death. Before we get into those real quick, though, um, let me just stop and ask you, why am I lingering on this? Like, why is it significant that James was an early leader of the church? Like, what does that suggest about the church? What does that suggest about him? I mean, it's a big, like, transformation for like him being a relative of Jesus and him also living with him for so long and not believing in what he was saying to where now he's leading a whole church and a group of people as well like that those people also trust in him as well even though he at once had denied Jesus yeah so on one hand from uh, when, in regards to him it shows that he did have like Paul a transformative experience after the death of Jesus, which turned him from a person who was totally opposed to his brother to somebody who became like willing to like <laughs> like lead the like the early church, right? I mean that, that's pretty crazy, right? So we it tells us first off that his faith was genuine, right? It doesn't prove that Jesus resurrected, it simply proves that his faith was genuine. It also shows us that the rest of the church also trusted that his faith was genuine. Right? The fact that they were willing to entrust him, like, leadership of the foundational and formational church, whenever the apostles were scattered, that says quite a bit. Right? So the fact that they give him the final say in the Jerusalem council, that says that 
they must have seen a pretty big shift in James. He's proven right? himself somehow. Yeah, because I mean the apostles were probably there whenever Jesus said, Who is my brother? Who's my brother? Like, you know, who's my mother, brother, and sister? Right? So they were there whenever Jesus rejected James. And now all of a sudden, they are saying, Hey James, we're leaving here. Do you want to stay and be in charge? Like yeah. something has shifted. Right? And so I, that's what I'm trying to highlight. That's why we're looking at all this evidence, right? It's just because we're trying to say, like, as historians, you have to figure out what happened in between, right? That's what we're asking. All right. Uh, so like I said, uh, whenever you go outside of the Bible, um, very early on, uh, within the early centuries, we actually have several reports about the death of James. Um, what do y'all want to read this from Josephus? Remember, Josephus is a first century Jewish historian, uh, writes a lot of really useful stuff. What do y'all want to read it? Sorry, from when? Uh, just, just all the gray. Right, so just Josephus Antiquities of the Jews. I got it. Okay. When, therefore, Annas? Uh, Ananus. Ananus was of this disposition. He thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but, but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called... Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions, and when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Perfect. All right, so Josephus, he's writing during the first century, right? So this is within a few decades of these events. He says, uh, but Josephus doesn't really talk a lot about Jesus, right? He mentions, I think, he mentions John the Baptist, he mentions Jesus, he mentions James. Right? But he doesn't go on about them for like a long time. He is simply a historian mentioning relevant details. And he mentions, hey, remember that group called the Christians, which I mentioned before? Well, Jesus, he had a brother named James, and at one point, the Jewish leaders decided to have him killed. Right? And so the Sanhedrin of Judges, they got James together with some of his buddies, and they basically delivered him over to be stoned. Right? Does that prove that he was murdered? No. It just shows that very early on, we have somebody who was not a Christian who claims that James was killed. And it also doesn't necessarily say that he was killed for his faith, right? It simply says that he was the brother of Jesus who was called Christ. It doesn't mention that James' death was directly tied to testifying about Jesus. It simply says that he died, right? But we do have good reason to believe that for some reason, James, well, early on, at least Josephus believed that James was killed and died a death. All right, um, Eusebius, Church History. Brianne, could you read that one? Mm -hmm. Then James, whom the ancients surnamed the just on account of the excellence of his virtue, is recorded to have been the first to be made bishop of the Church of Jerusalem. This James was called the brother of the Lord because he was known as the son of Joseph, and Joseph was supposed to be the father of Christ. But Clement, in the seventh book of the same work, re relates also the following things concerning James. The Lord, after his resurrection, imparted knowledge to James the Just, to John and Peter. And they imparted it to the rest of the apostles. And the rest of the apostles to the seventy, of whom Barnabas was one. But there were two Jameses, one called the Just, who was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and was beaten to death with a club by a fuller, and another who was beheaded. Paul also makes mention of the same James the Just, where he writes, Other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Perfect. Thank you. So Eusebius, he is a church historian who's writing a few centuries after the time of Christ, but he is quoting Clement, who was writing at the end of the first century. Right? So Clement is somebody who is writing a lot earlier. And so we actually have two different things being brought together here. And you notice he's also quoting some New Testament in there as well. Mm -hmm. right? So Eusebius does mention, like I've already said, that he was the first to be made bishop of the Church of Jerusalem. Right? So he says James was like, for, when it comes to the Jerusalem church, James was declared the first pastor. Right? He was the lead pastor of the Church of Jerusalem after the apostles scattered. That's pretty cool. But... Uh, more significantly, when we go a little bit further down, he's quoting Clement, which once again is from the first century. Uh, the Lord, after his resurrection, imparted knowledge to James the Just and John and Peter. So apparently after his resurrection, Jesus showed up 
to those three guys and gave them special information. Well, that would line up with what Paul says whenever he says they were refuted to be pillars, right? It seems like these guys had special insight that maybe other people did not. Uh, and then they imparted that to the rest of the apostles, the rest of the apostles of the 70. And then, um, this is where, this is just so useful, right? Eusebius goes on, or I don't know if this is Eusebius still quoting Clement or not. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, but he even goes on to clarify, there are two Jameses, and that can be a little bit confusing, right? There's one James, and that is the brother of Jesus, right? Uh, and that is the one that goes out in history known as James the Just. So whenever you look at other texts outside the Bible, stuff like that, and you hear about this guy named James the Just, that is James' brother of Jesus. Uh, and he even said in the very beginning, right, that's the brother of the Lord, because he was known as the son of Joseph, and Joseph was supposed to be the father of Christ. Like, he's being very clear, that's the James we're talking about. That's James the Just. And then there's another James, and that James was beheaded. And this one he's talking about is James, son of Zebedee. Because if you go to Acts chapter 12, that's what happens. Right? James, son of Zebedee, uh, the brother of John, he is the first uh, apostle who is martyred. Right? That's around AD 42 to 44, somewhere in there. That is ultimately why the apostles leave Jerusalem, probably. Uh, which would be the reason why James, the brother of Jesus, is put in charge of Jerusalem when they leave. Right? And so, basically, Clement is explaining, hey, it's a bit confusing because, you know, there was already a Peter, James, and John group, and now there's another Peter, James, and John group. And that might be confusing because there's two different Jameses, and we're talking about one and not the other, and one and not the other. But in this testimony, notice he does not say that James the Just was stoned. He says that he was pushed from the pinnacle of the temple, and then he didn't die on impact. And so they came, and then they beat him to death with a club. Which sounds absolutely like a terrible way to die. Uh, but I mentioned this last week. Um, if this story is true, um, there is a certain beauty to it. Uh, because if you recall, whenever Jesus was being tempted by Satan, he was taken to the pinnacle of the temple. Uh, and Satan tempted him and said, why don't you cast yourself down from this pinnacle and let God send his angels to carry you? And Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, and so it's, it's very interesting that Jesus was confronted with a temptation to be pushed down. Uh, whereas... Well, no, he was being confronted by the temptation to jump down, uh, whereas James, his brother, might have very well been put, like, standing in that same place a few decades later and was actually pushed down to his own demise. Like, there's, like, a poetic beauty to that. Like, Jesus, because he wanted to die on our behalfs, was not willing to throw himself off the pinnacle because he did not want to bow to sin. And then James, because of his confidence in his brother's resurrection, was willing to be thrown off the pinnacle and die. Right? That's interesting. Um, main thing there is that we actually have two accounts which aren't necessarily contradictory, because, but, but they do say that he died in different ways. Right? One says that he was stoned. The other one says he was thrown off the pinnacle and that he was beaten to death with clubs. I mean, you could reconcile those and say, well, maybe they pushed him off, then they threw stones at him, then they beat him with a club. That's possible. But ultimately, that's not what matters. As a historian, you're simply looking and you're saying, we have two very early accounts that say that he died, mm-hmm. right, in, in a very violent and brutal fashion, uh, in some way related to his faith. Okay, we move on. Uh, this one, this is an extended account. I'll read the whole thing because it's a, uh, it's pretty long, and I don't want to make y'all do that. But uh, we can I, chunk it. Yeah, we can yeah we'll, we'll just we'll alternate, right? We'll go in circles. Yeah. Uh, what I like about this account is that it uh, it gives us a lot more information about James, and I just think it's really cool. And uh, this is one of those like cool little church history tidbits that I just wanted to share because it's kind of fun. All right, uh, Ben, will you take the first paragraph and then we'll just kind of go around the circle here. And, and also, just so you know, it's multiple slides also. So, go for it. The manner of James' death has been already indicated by the above quoted words of Clement, who records that he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and was beaten to death with a club. But, I have no idea how to say that. Hey, Jessipus. <laughs> Jessipus who lived immediately after the apostles, gives the most accurate account in the fifth book of his memoirs. He writes as follows. My turn? Yeah. James, the brother of the Lord, succeeded to the government of the church in conjunction with the apostles. He has been called the just by all from the time of our Savior to the present day, for there were many that bore the name of James. He was holy from his mother's womb, and he drank no wine nor strong drink, nor did he eat flesh. No razor came upon his head. He did not anoint himself with oil, and he did not use the bath. 
he alone was permitted to enter into the holy place, for he wore not woolen but linen garments. And he was in the habit of entering alone into the temple, and was frequently found upon his knees, begging forgiveness for the people, so that his knees became hard like those of a camel, in consequence of his constantly uh, bending them in his worship of God and asking forgiveness for the people. Therefore, many, even of the rulers, believed. There was a commotion among the Jews and scribes and Pharisees who said that there was danger that the people would be looking for Jesus the Christ. Coming therefore in a body to James, they said, We entreat you, restrain the people, for they are gone astray and regarding Jesus as if he were the Christ. All right. We'll, we'll read the rest in a second, but I just want to comment on this. It's so fun. Uh, and I even put dot, dot, dot in there because this account is much longer. I was just condensing it. But some of this could be you know, expanded and legendary, right? But it also could be true. Um, but he says, um, basically, Jessup is here. He is saying the same thing that Clement said, right? That James the Just is the same as James' brother of Jesus. And he actually explains why he's called James the Just, right? Because there's a lot of people named James. The name James is just Jacob. It's a very common name, right? And so he says there were a lot of people named James at this time period. you got James, son of Zebedee, James, son of Alphaeus. you got all these Jameses. Well, you had to distinguish him somehow, and his title was the just, because he was known for being especially righteous, right? Um, he's described in a very strange way, right? Um, he drank no wine, right? So he didn't drink alcohol, right? He didn't eat flesh. He was apparently like a vegetarian or something like that. Um, no razor came upon his head. He did not anoint himself with oil. He didn't bathe. Um, I'm assuming when it says he did not bathe, it's not saying that he did not wash himself. I'm assuming it's saying that he did not have to... Um, dip himself in the mikvah that much, right? Like the, the, yeah, the mikvah is the ritual cleansing that Jews would have to go through. I think the idea is that it's saying he was so holy, yeah. like he didn't even have to, he was never unclean, right? He was always in a state of ritual cleanness, right? So it's just emphasizing his cleanness. Um, he alone was permitted to enter the holy place. That's crazy, yeah. right? Because keep in mind, he is not a Levite, right? He's from the tribe of Judah. And so if he is being permitted to enter into the temple, like, it's not saying the most holy place, right? Not the holy of holies, right? The holy of holies is only the high priest. But it's saying, like, this is a big deal, right? You've got a person who is not a Levite priest, who is almost like an honorary Levite priest because of how righteous he is. And this is how well-known he was amongst the community. Which is interesting because you get the implication that maybe prior to following Jesus, James wasn't too unlike Paul, yeah. right? To where, like, by his description, it almost sounds like he was kind of on the same path, right? Righteous of the righteous, Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? To where he was devoting himself to God in a totally different way, which also makes sense because if you think about it, I mean, there's a reason why Mary and Joseph were chosen to be the mother, the, the parents of Jesus because they were awesome, right? And so it, it would make sense that maybe, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but like it would make sense that if you've got parents like Mary and Joseph, you've got a brother like Jesus, you're probably going to end up being pretty cool too, right? And so James seems to have been pretty remarkable as well. They called him Camel Knee James because uh, he uh, he was always on his knees praying for people, so his knees became calloused and hard. Uh, and that, that's, that's just really cool, right? Is this legendary? Maybe. I just think it's kind of cool. But as you get to the bottom here, you see where it begins to set up the martyrdom. Because ultimately what happens is that some of the Pharisees and stuff, they hear about this new sect called Christianity. And they're nervous because they're thinking that people are going to start following Jesus if they believe he is the Christ and the Son of God. And so basically, they go get James, and they say, hey, you're his brother. Can you just tell everybody that they don't know what they're talking about, right? And that he's not who he claims to be. Let's continue the story. Ben, pick it up for us. All the way down? The oh, yeah, yeah. The aforesaid. aforesaid scribes and Pharisees therefore placed James upon the pinnacle of the temple and cried out to him and said, You just won, in whom we ought all to have confidence... For as much as the people are led astray after Jesus, the crucified one, declare to us, what is the gate of Jesus? And he answered with a loud voice, Why do you ask me concerning Jesus, the Son of Man? He himself sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power, and is about to come upon the clouds of heaven. So they went up and threw down the just man, and said to each other, Let us stone James the just. And they began to stone him. For he was not killed by the fall, but he turned and knelt down and said, 
I entreat you, Lord God, our Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And while they were thus stoning him, one of the priests of the sons of Rechab, the son of the Rechabites, who are mentioned by Jeremiah the prophet, cried out, saying, Stop, what are you doing? The just one prays for you. And one of them, who was a fuller, took the club with which he beat out clothes and struck the just man on the head, and thus he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot by the temple, and his monument still remains by the temple. He began a he became a true witness, both to Jews <clears throat> and Greeks, that Jesus is the Christ, and immediately Vespasian besieged. Vespasian, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is just such a cool story. I once again, much of it could be legendary. I don't know, but it still comes from very early on. And so there could be a shred of truth to it. But this all like a lot like this account, it explains a lot of the stuff, right? So you remember in the first two accounts, in one it said that he was killed by stoning. The other one said that he was pushed from the pinnacle of the temple and beaten with to death with a fuller's like club. Mm-hmm. And then I had said, oh, what had happened? Well, maybe he was pushed from the pinnacle of the temple, beaten with stones, and then beaten with a club. And whenever you read this, that is exactly what is described. It's like, well, yeah, that's what happened. But not only that, but it actually explains why he was on the pinnacle of the temple. Right? It's not saying, it's not like they went up there being like, hey, how can we make this guy's death brutal? <laughs> Instead, it seems like they were taking him to a public place because they wanted him to testify on their behalf. Right? It's like they're trying to put an end to this Christian sect once and for all. So they get up there to the pinnacle of the temple and they say, James, we know that you're the real deal. Right? You're James the Just. They say, you know your brother. You know this thing is fake. Like, you know this thing is fake. And we know we have confidence in you. So once and for all, in front of everybody, will you just tell everybody that this whole thing is a hoax? And then James looks at them and says, I can't. He says, no. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God right now. He is the Son of Man. And so basically, it, like, James just screws them over. He says, guys, I can't, tell, I can't give you what you want. And so this moment that was supposed to be a winning moment for the Pharisees, right? They have him publicly up here for everybody to hear. It turns into something utterly embarrassing. And so they have an option to either all convert or double down and kill him, mm-hmm. right? And so they say, James, you have been deceived too, basically. And so they say, they push him off, right? But then he doesn't die. And so they begin to stone him. And then he gets up and begins to pray like Stephen or something like that. And they say, guys... James is praying for you. This isn't a good look. Like, just take him out of your take him out of his misery. And so, God comes over and, and kills him, right? And so it's very brutal, but it actually harmonizes all the other accounts, which is pretty interesting. And then notice that last phrase: and immediately Vespasian besieged them. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's continue. This is the final part. Um, I'll read this. These things are related at length by Hegesippus who is in agreement with Clement. James was so admirable a man and so celebrated among all for his justice that the more sensible even of the Jews were of the opinion that this was the cause of the siege of Jerusalem, which happened to them immediately after his martyrdom for no other reason than their daring act against him. So Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. And according to this account, like James died not that long before, right? I don't know if it's like a few days or a few months or something like that. But the idea is it was really quick, and according to Eusebius and Hegesippus, early on, there were some Jewish people who literally admired James so much that whatever Jerusalem light and ashes, they said, this is because you killed James, right? Y'all killed James, and therefore, that's what happened here. And they're actually almost right, um, but it's not because they killed James, it's because they killed James' brother, mm. right? Uh, and so, really, it's, they added insult to injury. Right? Not only did they kill Jesus, but they almost killed Jesus twice. Because, you know, whenever you persecute Jesus as people, you persecute Jesus himself. Right? And so by pushing James' brother um, off the pinnacle of the temple, um, they, they killed Jesus all over again. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that ultimately is why Jerusalem fell. But I just think that's so interesting. Right? So even at that time period, there were people who, they had so much respect for James, that they were like, I can't believe you did that. Like, Jerusalem will fall because you killed James. That's like... They're showing him the respect of a prophet. Mm-hmm. That's just pretty cool. I mean, that also should just testify to us, like, what type of people we should be. Mm-hmm. 
Because these are not Christians who are saying this. This is just Jewish people. But they had so much respect for James, even if they didn't agree with his belief about Jesus, that they just thought he was the real deal. Right? That's how people should be about us, right? Where they're like, okay, you know what? He may be Christian, but man, it's a solid dude. <laughs> like, so, I don't know. I think that's very interesting to me. All right. Sean McDowell concludes the following in regarding to James' martyrdom. Firstly, James was executed by stoning. Um, this is the highest possible probability, and that's mainly because we have that reported very early on in the first century. Right? And it's also just typically how Jews would um, execute the death penalty. Secondly, James died as a Christian martyr. Very probably true. Remember, that first account from Josephus, it didn't tell us why he died. It simply said that he was killed by stoning. So we don't know for sure that it was as a result of you know, his faith in Jesus. But it's very probably true because I mean, it, it would make sense why he was stoned, especially because the rest of his reputation is so good. Um, and all the other early accounts we have also say that. James was thrown down from a high structure at the temple, uh, more probable than not, right? So we actually have very good reason to believe that this is what actually happened just because we have so many early accounts that talk about it. We have later accounts that talk about it too, and they get legendary and stuff, but um, these are all within the first few centuries that report this, and so we have good reason to believe that not only did James convert to Christianity, but he also went to die for his faith. Mm. That is um, very useful. So... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, our earliest evidence of the resurrection reports that the resurrected Jesus appeared to James. If you remember, that's where Paul says, I reported to you what was first handed down to me, that Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to James, and then to the 12, and then to 500 at the same time. Mm -hmm. So he mentions James there. If this event were fabricated to give James credibility and authority over the church, we would expect later accounts to elaborate on the event. However, that's not what happens. There's not a single account that we have that actually details the moment that Jesus appeared to his brother, right? The only time that we actually see that appearance mentioned is in 1 Corinthians 15. Instead, the only thing later accounts provide us with is information explaining that the brothers of Jesus were skeptical of their brother, right? So Paul's writing 1 Corinthians 15. Later on, the gospel authors write their stories, which is weird because they mention that Jesus' brothers are skeptical and you would think that if they were really concerned with justifying and establishing the leaders in the church, they would at least like detail a conversion story, right? I mean, with Paul, at least you get a conversion story, right? With Paul, it's like, oh, you see how the persecutor became the apostle. But they don't even get that, right? They tell us, hey, the brothers of Jesus, they did not like him. And then they just like leave it there, right? And they never address it again. And so if you're just looking at the Gospels, you are left to believe that they stayed like adversaries of Jesus. But then you go to the book of Acts, and they're not. And so you're looking at it, and you're like, wait, how did this happen? And the only answer that we have would be 1 Corinthians, but that also explains everything. The criterion of embarrassment lends credibility to this as being factual, since it seems unlikely that the early church would fabricate something so critical of one of its pillars. Right? If they were not adversarial in the beginning, why would you make that up? And... <laughs> If they were adversarial and you wanted to justify them being a pillar later, why would you not make up a story about the conversion? Like, why would you leave that unexplained? Why would you just trust that Paul is going, like, that you're putting a lot of trust in one cursory reference to James in 1 Corinthians 15, right? And so this all just rings to, it, it's not people trying to justify anything. They're simply reporting the facts. And they just didn't feel the need to mention the appearance to James. Right? I mean, they mentioned it whenever they're defending it. Yeah, he appeared to James. But they don't need to detail the actual story in the Gospels or in Acts. Right? It's sim they're simply recording the history. Right? That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is what uh, Herschel, Shanks, and Ben Witherington say. It appears that James, like Paul, was a convert to the Jesus movement because at some juncture he saw the risen Jesus. For nothing prior to Easter can explain his having become such a follower of Jesus much less a leader of Jesus' followers. Something dramatic must have happened to James after the death of Jesus to account for his being included in Acts among the disciples and later named as leader of the Jerusalem church. It seems clear that it was Jesus' appearance to him that mainly accounts for his conversion to the movement and his rise to prominence. Mike, like, uh, I mean, Gary Habermas says, while we are not told that it was Jesus' appearance to James that caused his conversion, we have to provide the best explanation for the change 
and for James's promotion as one of the chief leaders in the early church. Given his previous skepticism, the appearance of James is significant. Right? So the Bible never says that that appearance is the thing that converted him. But you've got to ask yourself, if you spent your entire life thinking that your brother is not the Son of God, and then he is publicly executed as a criminal, what could possibly convince you that he was the Son of God afterwards? Mm-hmm. And then what would make you go die for that belief? Well, maybe if your brother showed up to you and let you see the holes in his hands. And he's like, yeah, I, I was telling the truth. And you're like, oh, crud. <laughs> I, guess, like, I, guess, I guess so. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. Right? I mean, you could give another explanation, but, I mean, good luck. Right? I mean, people will try, but, I mean, it, it's going to be hard. Right? The resurrection, it, it's, the, it's like the, it's the puzzle piece that makes it all make sense. Right? I mean, you could try to come up with some other theory, but they're going to be more far-fetched. If a resurrection actually occurred... You don't have to theorize anymore. You're like, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> I get it now. So uh, let's bring this to an end uh, so that we can then arrive at our conclusions. So summary, Jesus' brothers did not believe in him during his ministry. Jesus' brothers taunted him during his ministry. Jesus' brothers were apparently absent at Jesus' crucifixion, where Jesus entrusted the care of his mother to one of his disciples, suggesting his brothers were non-believers at the time. Jesus' brothers were in the upper room with Jesus' disciples and mother after the resurrection. James was an apostle and leader in the Jerusalem church. Paul reported his activities to James. It would appear that at least some of Jesus' brothers became believers. James' transformation from skeptic to believer is plausibly explained by his belief that Jesus had been raised and by a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to him. And add to all that, that two of the books of the Bible are written by brothers of Jesus, the book of James and the book of Jude. Therefore, we can conclude that James believed his risen brother appeared to him. And that is the enemies of Christ being converted, right? As a reminder, that does not prove that Jesus resurrected. It simply proves that we have at least two examples of people who at one point were bitter enemies of Jesus, yet eventually became leaders in the church. And both of them have the shared experience of experiencing what they believed to genuinely have been a resurrection appearance of Jesus after his death. That doesn't prove that it's true. It simply means that if you are going to come up with a theory about this, you have to answer that as well, right? So not only do you have to answer how Jesus died of death by crucifixion, not only do you have to answer how the tomb was empty, not only do you have to answer what to do with all those other appearances, not only do you have to answer um, why the apostles would go and die for all the stuff, now you also have to explain why people who had zero motive to become Christians all of a sudden became Christians and then went on to die for their faith for it. So as a historian, if you're going to come up with a conclusion, that's what you have to face. All right. For us, we are now going to go into our concluding thoughts. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to pray us out so we can end this video. And then for those of y'all who are watching online, you can come back probably like tomorrow or two days from now and I will upload the rest of the video Uh, which will give you our concluding thoughts about the resurrection. Uh, So real quick, I will pray this out, and then we will hop in. Lord, we thank you for just giving us so much evidence for this, God. I mean, the fact that you came down and died for us and resurrected, I mean, that already is amazing enough. You didn't even have to leave us all this evidence for it, though, right? You could have made it to where, like, you challenged us to live by faith, God, and you could have made that a huge leap of faith, right? You could have made it to where... We simply had to blindly trust that these things happened. But you didn't, right? Instead, you have given us so much evidence that it's not really even a leap of faith, God. It's a step of faith, right? We're like stepping over the crack in a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And so we thank you for that because that is a gift of grace that we often overlook. Um, We're not entitled to this information, but you have given it to us. And you have given us so much more. And every day we get more of it. And so I pray that we won't just become smarter from this, God, but... um, I pray that as we go about the study, we will become more confident in our assurance of the resurrection and therefore will live in light of the resurrection with the same boldness and confidence of Paul, right? The same boldness and confidence of the apostles, the same boldness and confidence of James, to where we will look at your resurrection as the make or break moment, not only in Christianity, but in all human history. And whenever we live from day to day to day, from moment to moment, we will recognize that we serve a risen Savior, 
and therefore we should live as people who do not fear death and who are living for a life beyond that which we presently see. We love you, God, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.